the first of a series of NEA events. Um, if you're interested in knowing about the rest of this series, I think we've got a sign-up sheet of that you could sign up and find out about more of the events that we have coming up, um, which will start, Monica, help me out. I think uh, after the first of the year will be the, the other three events in this series, which will be also here at Redmond Press. Um, so we're very excited about being part of this series, and we're also extremely excited about this launch event um, with th these amazing writers, Kristen Niyadis Young, who came all the way down from Seattle to moderate this event and read you a little bit of her book, Subduction. Carlos Allende, who is the author of Coffee, Coffee, Murder, Coffee Shopping Murder Love. Um, and it's a book that makes murder seem like quite a bit of fun. <laughs> and of course, Juan Felipe Herrera, who needs no introduction. Um, I wanted to just say briefly that uh, we are very uh, excited about this art show that's up in this space. It celebrates water, something we don't have enough of in California. Um, if you have questions about the art show, feel free to talk to us afterwards. Also, if you know anybody that's wishing to have either a photography show or an art show here, here feel free to talk with Toby and I, uh, and we're happy to, um, to, to get any recommendations from any of you because we're for future art shows. Um, we're very excited to have all of you here. We're very excited to be here with these amazing writers. And we're also really excited about these drummers that just showed up. Um, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming the amazing, the talented, Kristen Nieves. Yeah. So I am so honored to be here. I have to say, um, it. I try. I try to read everything that has ever been written by the people that I moderate for, um, and that is um, something that allows me to delve deeply into practice. I. It reminds me. I went into this museum one time, and there was a retrospective of this artist's work, and he had, it was uh, Max Weber, um, German abstract um, impressionist, and. Um, they had all the paintings lined up in the room, and you could see that his lines grew bolder and his colors grew more saturated. And it's a beautiful way to uh, check in with the progression and to really see how rewarding this path can be, um, although it doesn't always feel that way. And uh, but I have to say, uh, with the readers that we have tonight, um, I, I was hard pressed to uh, to read everything that they'd ever written uh, and, and produced. And I'm going to share some of their bio uh, before they begin. And then uh, we're going to each uh, read an excerpt of, of our work and then come up for uh, an onstage conversation uh, during which time I really do welcome your curiosity and I hope that you will share any questions that you may have um, as I'm serving as moderator. But for now, some bios. Carlos Allende is a media psychology scholar and writer of fiction. He has written two previous novels, Cuadrillas y Contradanzas, a historical melodrama set during the war of reform in Mexico, and Love or The Witches of Windward Circle, a horror farce sent in Venice, California. Based on his research on narrative persuasion and audience engagement, he developed the course of the psychology of compelling storytelling, which he teaches in the writer's program at UCLA Extension. 
Now, he lives in Santa Monica with his husband. And what I find so interesting about his approach to writing, coffee, shopping, and murder and love, which is just published by Redmond Press, is that peering through the frothy avarice that compels his protagonist, Charlie Jignesh, into ever-escalating mistakes, you can see how their disaffection and loneliness are an indictment of a certain kind of queer culture under capitalism. Charlie and Jignesh disclose their traumas and humiliations as casual asides in difficult moments and then they block their ways the rest of their lives. So Carlos actually practices what he teaches, not everyone does, and has crafted an engaging story that applies knowledge gleaned from behavioral science as well as media and social psychology. Quite the feat. Um, and before we begin with applause, let me share this bio on the planet right now. Um, it's gonna take me a minute. <clears throat> the son of farm workers, poet Juan Felipe Guerrero was born in Fowler, California in 1948. He is a graduate of UCLA, Stanford University, and the University of Iowa Writers Workshop. During the last 50 years, Herrera has dedicated his life to poetry, community, art, and teaching. He served as Poet Laureate of the United States from 2015 to 2017, and Poet Laureate of California from 2012 to 2015. And now you understand why I couldn't get through all of them. He has written more than 30 books, people. 30 in various genres. I mean, I, I need to get to work. Um, his recent books of poems are Every Day We Get More Legal, which came out in 2020 from City Lights, and I think, uh, 2022, a book in translation. Herrera is a recipient of the 2022 Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize. So one of his poems, uh, Sunriders, was actually placed in a capsule of the NASA ship Lucy, an unproved robotic interplanetary uh, spacecraft that was launched in the fall of 2021 to explore asteroids and his son regarding the lifespan of Earth. So he, he sent a poem into space. <laughs> okay? Um, stretch goals, stretch goals. Um, recently, his visual art was featured in the galleries of Monterey Art Museum in uh, Monterey, California. And currently, he's finishing a poetry collection on the war in Ukraine called A Handful of Gravel. The Juan Felipe Herrera Elementary School, where students who learn both English and Spanish, opened in Fresno in August. His awards and honors include the National Book Critics Circle Award, a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Los Angeles Times Robert Kirsch Award for Lifetime Achievement, the Latino Hall of Fame Award, a Pushcart Prize. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to read all of them. You know, I know I won't do it. I'm going to do it. Um, a, a Lifetime Achievement Award, Fred Cody Lifetime Achievement Award, and UCLA Chancellor's Meadow. So he lives in Fresno with his wife, the poet Margarita Robles. In his poem entitled Enough, he wrote, This is not a poor boy story, this is a pioneer story. This is your story. America, are you listening? Recasting Latinos in the very center of this country which we helped build and continue to feed and care for. And that is something that my novel's abduction also engages. The knowledge that because most American Latinos are migrants, we also become settlers the moment we settle in this country. A fact which pervades real responsibility to indigenous communities and the stewards of this land. His poem, Enough, ends with, used to think I was not American enough, now it is the other way around, which gives me hope for a future national consciousness that reflects our own faces back to the collective. Reorientations of any kind require a systems level disruption that is difficult to face. Most people measure gravity from ground zero. In truth, we do not look up at the night sky. You could say that we're looking down. Try that the next time you arrive the cosmos. Look down into the stars. More truly, we're looking out, pinned by our own weight to where we stand. And today, we fly. Voiced by Redman Press, who along with Edgar Latina, curated the series Voices at the Center of American Literature with support from the National Endowment of the Arts. I'm grateful to the whole team, from Kate and Mark to Toby and Monica and Tanika, for the way that they've held me up to the light. So, please welcome our first reader, Carlos A. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you for being here. Uh, I normally read something, uh, but my, my, my book follows Charlie and Jignesh. Charlie is from uh, Litchfield, Kentucky, and uh, Jignesh is an Indian American. And I always read from the point of view of Charlie, but 
I decided to read from the point of view of Gignesh today. And um, so this is from the uh, first chapter. Sorry, I'm taking too long. He's having a fight with Nina. They're in an office, and uh, Gignesh is the uh, uh, bookkeeper, glorified uh, CFO. And Nina is a German intern that is leaving the country. So she's supposed to have left, but she came to the office to print her ticket. Meanwhile, he's working. It's a Sunday. He's working on his novel. And uh, so they start having a. Uh, he he's writing, and then uh, and then uh, he sees Nina coming inside. Sorry, sorry. I turn around. Nina has come to the mezzanine and is standing next to me with a sheaf of papers. I cover the screen with my hands. I beg your pardon? And this is Nina. You've been stealing company resources. Pardon me? I managed to, to turn off the monitor. I am going to show this to Mike. Mike is the boss. She holds up the sheaf of papers. Oh, shit. What is she holding? What does she know? I must have left something in the, in the printer. Something incriminating. Miguel Hidalgo's receipts. Is that what she's holding? Miguel is my little Mexican hero, an expensive handyman but worth every penny. He fixes problems before they're even reported. He fixes problems that never existed at all. Our homeowners love him. I love him too. He's cheap, sends his invoices via email, and gets paid whenever I have the time. If he existed, I'd marry him. He doesn't. Therefore, it is me who has to cash all his checks. Nina must have found the receipts. I must have left them in the printer skewed. And they must have come up with uh, when she turned it on. I need a glass of water. I need air. She knows I've been stealing. I don't know what you mean. I managed to calm myself and laugh defiantly. I've always been a wonderful actor. You know what I mean, fatso. It cannot be that much, can it? Those receipts were e weren't even a hundred dollars. But if Mike learns they're fake, he may then want to check all of the others. Why do I worry? Mike doesn't even know how to turn on a computer. Then again, he may ask the accountant to check. How much has it been this month? 600? More like 1,600. About 8,000 for the year so far. I got a little greedy. Give me that! I leap out of my chair, trying to snatch the sheaf of papers. Nine! Nina laughs, pulling back. Give me that, you stupid twat! Give me those fucking papers! Nine! Oh, she's laughing now. She's enjoying it. How can she be so beautiful and so harmless? I'll go straight to jail if we get audited. Nina, give me those papers. No. She's at the edge of the stairs. I could just push her. I wouldn't be that, it wouldn't be the worst thing I did to her in the last four months. Nina, I know we have had our, our differences, but let's be civilized. Give me those papers. They're important. No. I throw my pencil cup at her. She acts surprised. What did she expect? I won't let her ruin me. Give me those fucking papers, I roar in anger. Nina runs upstairs. I sprint behind her. She trips in the last two steps and falls. I reach for the papers. She resists, but I'm at least a hundred pounds heavier than her and finally snatch them. They're not receipts. They're the first pages of Catacombs of the Shining Fear, which is the novel he has been writing. I forgot I had tried to print them earlier. I feel so silly. Princess Salmonella? Nina asked from the floor. Really? Did she read the first pages of my novel? I'm flattered. A reader, at last. Don't you know that Salmonella is a disease? She continues. It's a name, too, I replied. Nina tries to stand up. She can't. Crap. I pushed the intern down the stairs. No, I didn't push her. She fell while I was chasing her. But she's not an intern anymore. Can she sue us? Are you okay? I asked. I heard my race, you asshole. I'm terribly sorry this happened. You're a paranoid idiot. You threatened to show it to Mike so that he learns that you're wasting a co company paper. You came to print personal stuff too, and remind her about her train ticket. And besides, you shouldn't have read that what was obviously not meant for you. It is a first draft. I'm sure it must have a few typos. A few typos, she laughs. This is Schweizer. What would you know about first-class literature? I laugh more than you do. Justin lent me one of your books. Justin lent her one of my books? Now I'm confused. 
Justin knows that I write. Justin as in my worst enemy. Justin, the guy who refers to me as a she. The guy who photoshopped my face in a bukkake and posted it in the longer room so that the cleaners could see it. And it's embarrassing, Nina continues. Your book was so bad, I almost felt sorry for you. Justin bought one of my books. Three of my self-published novels are for sale on Amazon. Traces of a Lesser Kind has sold four copies. He bought all of them, Nina replies. All of them, including the sky beyond tomorrow. My heart starts beating fast. I'm baffled. Justin? I think Justin fucked that Chef Kettler. I thought that he hated me. He's so arrogant and unpleasant. Could he be secretly in love with me? Oh, had I only known. Justin looks as if the Marlboro man had used moisturizer. Tall, white, 29. He looks 27. Maybe now that he knows my soul, he regrets the way he has been treating me. I must confess that Justin's brown curls and his intriguing blue eyes inspired to lose clouds. He inspired me to break alchemism to the rogue and sexy criminal from Planet Argentaria in the Sky Beyond Tomorrow, Book One. In the Beyond Tomorrow series, Justin inspired all of the sexy and terribly mean villains in my books, and I am Princess Salmonella. He never told me he loved my books, I finally say with a gasp. I could have signed his copies. Nina starts laughing again. He bought them as a joke. What? Liar? He could have, he could have not disliked them? My God, Jimnesh, you are as fat as you are arrogant and stupid. What you write is shit. Schweizer. Nobody in his right mind would like your writing. It's fucking crap. You're nothing but a pretentious elephant dreaming of becoming a princess. You're a loser, Vignesh. That's what you are, a fucking loser. Okay. I may have been making Nina's life miserable for the last four months, continuously breaking the coffee pot and forcing her to go buy coffees for everyone, never reimbursing her on time, messing up the files she had been working on, I may have led my beautiful Clara and that shoddy corn girl Gabriel to believe that Nina had caught an STD that one time she called in sick. Nothing too serious, I said, but she's on antibiotics. And probably it wasn't too nice either when I asked Nina to trim a ring of legal paper that I had bought by mistake into letter size, and she had to use scissors because I hid the paper cutter. Still, she doesn't need to be this cruel. I know I'm fat. I've been fat all of my life. I am reminded that I'm fat every day by the continuous look of disapproval from random strangers, by the kind words of advice from baristas that recommend me buying a fruit cup instead of a stone, by the men I, date, I dare to conduct online who are unkind at all, and by my parents and siblings who think that they are doing me a favor when they say that no woman will ever want to marry a man my size as is. And I know I'm not popular. I've got more than my fair share of shame to remind me. I know, however, that I am a terrific writer. Nina cannot take that from me. You are jealous, I say, turning away to hide my tears. You are jealous because I write and you don't. You are jealous because I have talent and imagination. You are jealous because you are a skinny German witch with no kids and bad taste, and I am a true artist. Justin must have liked my books. I'm sure he adored me. For a second, silence. Then Nina starts laughing again. Not a forced, bitter laugh, not the one you would expect from a villain lying on the floor defeated, but actual crystalline, girly laughter the innocent laughter of someone who's still a child and a goddess. Even I find this despicable German witch charming. Her eyes are so blue, the skin is so even. Nina could be a model for a pre Raphaelite painting, and I am a fraud. I am not an artist. I am not a princess. Nina is. Nina is Queen Salmonella. She's also every person that has ever mocked me, I realize, feeling the lower part of my body suddenly get cold while my face and chest are burning. 
She's every girl that ever made me feel unwanted, every bully that ever smacked the back of my head, every white person who made fun of my name, my size, my nationality, and my skin color. And you're also a faggot, in exists. A morbidly obese and pretentious fucking faggot. You should do the world a favor and kill yourself. Everyone hates you. I sit on her face. She beats me. I press harder. She kicks with her knees. She pinches my butt. She tries to bite me. I push harder. I stay on top of her with my 245 pounds of queer Indian fat until Nina stops breathing. Thank you. I think Princess Salmonella has a certain ring to it, personally. Um, so I'm going to read a chapter from my novel, Subduction, which uh, read in press really, it's hard for me to explain how much respect I have for the team, given that this book launched one month after lockdown began. And they did not lay down and die and just say, throw their hands up and just kind of move on, right? A lot, I saw a lot of presses do that. They just kind of moved past that suite of authors. We kept going, right? In the problems of our days, we pivoted. Um, and I was so grateful for that because I, I spent 10 years researching this book. And so um, it meant so much to me. Um, and I knew how lucky I was to be working with people who worked so hard on behalf of their authors. So I just want to say that I'm grateful. Uh, it's called kind of a troubled history of encounter, um, as told through two protagonists who come together on the Macaw Nation at Nia Bay which is on the northwest of the lower 48 um, in Washington State, about four and a half hours west of where I live. And you know, this, this anthropologist, Claudia, she comes into this community uh, dragging her damage with her. Her husband just left her for her sister, and she, through her adjacency to whiteness, um, has kind of moved into a, a, a state of self-loathing that is, I think, familiar um, to many of us um, who have been told to become more like something that we are not. And then Peter um, has been away from the Macaw Nation for decades after experiencing a major trauma with his mother um, and has only recently returned because uh, he learned that she has uh, dementia and had become a hoarder uh, in his absence. So uh, this is chapter 14. It's the beginning pages of it. By the time they unearthed the colorful stacks of paper plate holders, his mother was whipping at batter. Peter felt sick to his stomach, wanted to tell her he'll make fry bread, but couldn't, not want to get her out of the way. The cleanup was ticking along smoothly, he and Claudia soaring back to Chachki. True, seeing evidence of his mother's obsessive, disordered mind made him feel like dying. He plunged his hands into hundreds of the Abay keychains, colors revealing their era of origin, first the beige and navy of the late 70s, then the fuchsia and highlighter yellow of the 80s, followed by the mauve and white 90s, which is when she seemed to have moved on to other things. Claudia wasn't saying much as she squatted over the piles, but you could tell she was thinking on something because her brow was furrowed, and she didn't seem to notice the aroma drifting from between her legs, warm and pungent. To be frank, she smelled like raw plants left in the sun, but he forgave her, considering that this was their smell, and the only reason he didn't find it familiar was that he liked to be long gone by this time after a tryst. Peter watched Claudia sort keychains by color, plopping them into plastic grocery bags, and he didn't bother to correct her obvious waste of time, happy to see her silky black hair fall over her cheek. From certain angles, she looked like she belonged here. He didn't let himself think that way. He would be something to settle down with such a pretty lady, even if she's on the skinny side. A man didn't need much more than a truck and a woman and a place to park them both. They could buy a new house and set it down where this broke down old trailer was as soon as it worked out. Gil broke in. He was daydreaming about his mother's passing, and there she was, in the kitchen. Luckily, Claudia didn't seem interested in sorting the fried food baskets by color. She stacked them off to the side, a puzzled look on her face being replaced by something more, a gradual dawning he wished she would share. We should throw this shit away. He kicked at a pile, she went, recycle it, donate it, whatever. There's nothing useful. 
I think she was saving it for a reason. Claudia trades a thin grip of plastic basket designed to hold a square of paper and fries, something crispy and delicious, which had not set for years held the dusty twin. She inserted her fingers into the lattice, slipped it a few from the stack, let them drop. Launched her feet thought so, but we know better. Peter grabbed the bag's keychain. It's gotta go. This place is a fire trap. You should have seen the newspapers, the phone books. You couldn't even move around, and it smelled. There's no plan here. Claudia did not answer him. Instead, she undid the knot of another bag, pulling from it four blankets, the kind Peter remembered from every couch of his childhood, the last saw at truck stops, thick velour and royal blue and crimson, covered with airbrushed wolves howling at the moon and eagles with outstretched wings. His mother's bed had nothing but a thin duvet cover with no down comforter inside it. She didn't like to sleep hot, she said, but it bothered him how she stinted herself while keeping blankets for bed that never been made, never been slept in. She was a goner. She'd been long gone by the time he got back to her. He didn't know what he was hoping for when he backed his shit in grief and desperation, troubled by her repeating mind, her addiction to worthless household items, the acquisition of one and another and another, never satisfied what she had, already fixated on the next one coming down the pipe. Kind of like his serial fuckery, but there's no mass grave of past lovers to shame him. And here was hers, disinterred. Let me talk to her. Claudia wiped her palm on her knees. This shit has to go. Claudia leaned in the doorway between the living room and the kitchen, where his mother had surrounded herself with a heaping bag of flour, a can of baking powder, a large cup of water to shake her salt. Beneath the old dish towel she used to cover the mixing bowl, the batter was rising, pushing the faded gingham into a conical tote that slipped off to one side. She was about to make Indian tacos, his favorite before the night his dad died, before he smelled batter and oil and blood as one, the memory of a warm penny in his mouth, always. He had never been able to eat fried bread since, never been able to go to a powwow in some distant city when he was missing home without staggering out, tears streaming from the oil and flour smell that hovered over the fairgrounds, the straight ladies in the park lot thinking he's just another sad drunk who shouldn't be around children. A shiver in his chest shuddered up to it and tipped his left eyelid. He couldn't stand a repeat of this morning's battle. A hard one calm kept his mom in its grip while the drugs lasted. Serene, she moved like she was in water, waiting from counter to counter, coming. Peter stepped into the damp cold, leaving the door open as he braced himself with these gulps. The more he inhaled, the more air he wanted, his chest heaving, lungs singed by his struggle to give himself what he needed. He could not get enough, could not fill himself up, but he kept trying bending over to prop himself against the trailer, huffing clean mist until his teeth buzzed. Calm down, he commanded himself. Calm down. Try not to hug himself in case the neighbors were watching. He walks the air and spun a tight circle like he was exercising, and he managed to step out sometimes. After he'd thrown enough punches to heat his cold sweat, running in place, feet thrumming like the wings of a hummingbird, he was glad to find a forsaken cigarette behind his ear and a lighter in his pocket, and that bird taste was never so good. He took it once, twice, Three times, the emperor hurrying toward the filter. Now he was relaxed. Now he could listen. Mine never turns out that stretchy. Claudia was such a kiss ass. His mother must be pulling the batter apart. Never need fry bread, that's a mistake. There was a thumb of dough falling onto the flour countertop like the old days. I'll remember that. Claudia didn't sound fake like he thought she might. Maybe she could learn something. But then, so, Maggie. He heard babbling. His mother always dipped a wooden spoon into the oil to make sure it was hot enough, and her silence. She could wait anyone out, a trick Peter used on his bosses, who filled his lengthy pauses with chattering, completing their own power, unused to his peculiar form of non-response, which could be mistaken for politeness. Claudia cleared her throat. So, Maggie, I was just thinking about all the wonderful things you've been gathering over the years, and I can't help but notice that a lot of them seem like gifts. Did she say gifts? Claudia's voice was softer. He backed toward the door, cocking his head to one side. The first piece of fryer bread went into the cast iron with a frenzied rush of hot broth. The sweat that had risen and vanished from his forehead was replaced, replenished by a line of beads across his brow. Stay put. His heart was beating. Stay put. I've seen this kind of gift before at that potlatch we attended on the Pulley Reservation. Remember? Another ball of dough with the oil into its fury. He had admired the sheer sure cussedness of women. They were squared off now, but his mother pulled out her stoic act and was quiet. 
the smell of fried wood sucking out the door and clawing onto him, his heart ricocheted around his chest, sweat running down his cheeks, his back against the wall. He slid down, covering his eyes, keeping his ears as close to the door to as he could stand, and turning his head every once in a while to catch a fresh breath. He heard a paper towel tear, and the bubbles were still, oil dripping. He imagined the fried bread being lifted onto a plate, soaked in the paper. Saw blood, too, the stain spreading across his mind. Were you planning a party? Claudia's voice was sweet. Were you planning an Indian party for Peter? Did, did you want to have a, a giveaway? Pass on some things? Like maybe his real name? Or the family songs? He heard a creaking wheeze, shattered coughs, a suppressed wail. Peering over his right shoulder, palm pivoting on the dirty concrete, he saw the dark crown of Claudia's head bent over his mother's small coiled braid. Saw her hands pat his mother's heaving back. Saw his mother encircle this stranger like she was a boy. Like they were saved and drowned. The two of them sobbing together. Claudia, that pantomime cunt. The two of them sobbing together. And him outside, dying alone. Thank you. Now, will you please give a warm welcome, not only to Juan Felipe Herrera, but also to this fabulous suite of musicians that he has brought to accompany him and bring us into the knowledge that the spoken word is music. So I'll let him introduce them, uh, but I just want to say how wonderful it is uh, that you brought these extra elements, and thank you for contributing your talents tonight. Okay, a warm welcome. Hey people, how you guys doing? How's that? Yeah. 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 Well, let's give a big hand to Carlos and to Preston. A big model. A big model. Wow. Uh, I like to write like that. I wish I could write like that, you know? It's, it's uh, so complex and so real. So complex and so real, isn't it? It was deep and it was, it was hard to get to. You know, to bring it out, you know, things that we have a hard time opening up to, and yet they were there for us, uh, both of them. How beautiful. Uh, how beautiful. So much, so hard, you know, so hard to write uh, novels. Uh, that's why I don't write. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could. I, I have to, I have to ask Carlos and Kristen. The magic. What, what's the magic? I think the magic is who they are. So another hand for Carlos and Kristen. Oh, that's right. Uh, this is Truk over here. T R O K A. That's right. We have a <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, John and Armando and Juan. John, Armando, and Juan. Uh, I uh, I called on John. I said, Hey, John, why don't you come up and uh, maybe we can just do something together? In the early 80s, uh, we did a lot of. Uh, uh, percussion and poetry in the Bay Area, and we traveled around a little bit, and it was, it was just it was a lot of fun. And uh, so I said, "Can you, you know, come on over and to the Red Hand, uh, La Casa de las Gallinas?" And and and, uh, and he says, "Oh, yeah, I'll come over. I may bring a friend or two." <laughs> that's, that's good. I, I know John about many years since uh, uh, the late seventies, and, and his familia. Uh, uh, Victor Martinez, uh, his late brother, was a really close friend, and the Martinez's uh, are amazing family. So I'm glad to see him here tonight, and uh, and his amazing uh, musicians, amazing musicians with us tonight. You know, I uh, I was looking at a uh, a photograph of uh, by a high school student, and uh, it was very interesting. There were three black and white photographs, and a photograph of a father wearing a sleeveless shirt, and uh, he, he was he was in the darkness. The father was in the darkness, but you could see him a bit, and 
And I think in, in that photo said, it said, uh, Todavía estoy aquí. The father was saying, I'm still here. I'm still here. And that really moved me. So this piece is called, Todavía estoy aquí. The deported father said, I'm still here. The deported father said, and it almost sounded like a flute. Still here, I am. Still here at times. Still here at half light. At times with you, peering at this odd angled orb. Todavía estoy aquí. For you, yes, para ti. Todavía. Still here, still here, I am for you, todavía, still here, it is true, para ti, for you in half light, it is this way, still full face toward you, still here for you, at times I sleep, at times all I can see, barely at times the shadow, that is me, not me, it is here still, the door open at times, at times burns, without me, even though I'm still here, I am still here todavía for you, para ti, on occasion you Notice me, look down, I look down, a smile, yes, a tiny smile, comes to me, for you, para ti, todavía aquí, here for you, here I am, all of us, in darker light filters than the last time we stood together. Todavía still here on this half or both of us, father, a clean washed shirt, and a scaldy shower to the air. Still you, me, without the shadow, the times the shadow. I cannot tell. I sleep. Blankets folded and unfolded. Todavía. Still. Para mí. For you. Todavía. Todavía. Estoy aquí. Para mí. Still here. I am still here. Yes. For you, I am. Six congas, we got, we got two congerazos, and we got John on the flauta and various, various flautas. How beautiful to have a sound and flute and, and talking of congas. They're also doing poetry. Well, you know, we've all been uh, hit very hard. Uh, it was happening everywhere and everything. It's not just Ukraine anymore. It felt like it was just Ukraine. It felt like the war was just Ukraine. It felt like the destruction was just Ukraine. But I get a feeling that it's everywhere. I get a feeling that it's everywhere. So, so. We will remember you. We will remember you. I will remember you. Your mother 
suggestion of the opera uh, Harpo Studios, <laughs> uh, a free chapter, 1993. Yeah. Uh, it was up uh, in Tulare, it was in Tulare, and, and, uh, and Ernesto Padilla's uh, man who published it. So he brought a big old box over, I said, I'll take them to Red Hand. So get yourself a copia, feel free to get more than one. And uh, you cannot pay in pesos that you want to buy the other books. <laughs> 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 yeah, 
Yeah. Okay, folks, let's uh, let's get on down to Kristen. Yes, I, have some, I told Kristen that I felt like it was like taking the oral, so I, I'm gonna have to get it together. Here. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, you need help. We got it. Ready to go. I mean, I need to bring a band for me. No, I'm in a band. I, I sit back up. I, I, I sit back up in a blue band. I mean, come on. <laughs> um, yeah, my friend Amber Plain, who actually has a beautiful book of poetry coming out on Redmond Press called Apocrypha, coming out of May. It is, wait till you see the cover. The cover you showed me, y'all. I mean, you have to yourself on that cover. It is beautiful. It's a gorgeous book about the language of love. And she sings blues too. Oh, wow. Um, so, um, listen, in America, we talk about it. You write about finding the courage to listen to yourself. What did you have to set aside or resist in order to make that decision to take care of yourself, to listen to your own needs and respond to the time? What did I have to... Uh, what did you have to kind of resist? Resist? Well, I had to let really let go of everything. You know, uh, it comes down to uh, dedicating dedicated my life to, to writing, and uh, you know what that means. Uh, my mother was, uh, she was at the apartment in, on Cap Street uh, in San Francisco, in Mission, and uh, she was just hanging out in the, in the, in the room, and she was, she was, Juanito, yeah, you're kind of making me a little worried about you. I said, how come? Well, I see you talking to yourself, talking to yourself while you're putting words on paper. <laughs> and that was right, you know. <laughs> that's right, that's what I do. And that's what I've done all these years, uh, many years. I think since I was uh, in high school. And, and it's not because I wanted to be a poet, it's just that that's the only uh, way I could, I found to, to really uh, express myself. It was very difficult to express myself uh, kind of just naturally in a sense, just, hey, how you doing? Let's, let's talk about life. That was very difficult. So then I just, or I'm feeling this way today. That was almost impossible. So so then I just started to write. So I had to abandon everything and I let everything go. All I did was uh, be ripped by a wrinkle in a little apartment uh, every day, nonstop. So that's, that's what I, and like, like both of you, I'm sure you both have to cut away from society at large. Except Carlos, he's involved with everything. <laughs> uh, really. So that's that's that was it. Resistance? What's what's resistance? You're showing us. Resistance. What I what I resisted? Is that it? Yeah. That the question? What I resisted? Uh, I don't think I resisted anything. I just had to jump in. You know, once you jump in, you're writing. Uh, I resisted, uh, don't want to resist something. I, I resisted, oh, I resisted certain things in my life. That's what I resisted. I resisted using the color black. I had a lot of fear about the color black. You know, I carried on, who knows, all kinds of myths in my head. So if I figured if I put the color black in a poem, it's going to come and get me. <laughs> and some way or another. I just had that feeling. It's like putting up black outfit on, like a uh, funeral, you know, you wear black, uh, more or less. And I figured if I put that in my poem, it's, it just was difficult, it was difficult. And there's a, pot, there's a little box of pop out and grab me, pull me in and suck me in, uh, kind of making fun of it. But I wasn't afraid of that. So I resisted that. And then I said, you know what, come on now, let's get to it. So then, so then, uh, then I began to put the color black in my poetry. And it was not only the color black, it was uh, truth and depth. I remember seeing the painting by uh, uh, Max uh, Beckman, who uses, uh, who was uh, cast out from uh, uh, Nazi Germany uh, because of his paintings. 
And he ended up teaching, uh, Max Beckman ended up teaching in uh, New York and giving our classes and workshops. And he told his students, if you're not using black in your painting, you might as well tear your painting up and get out of here. <laughs> and I said, oh, no. So I looked at his paintings again, and you should see that the way that black pops out of his painting. It's, it's so powerful. And it just brings out everything he's painting to life. So it wasn't death, it was life. It was truth. So that's one thing I resisted. And uh, it was, it took me a while. I'm reminded of uh, Rita Lucky, and he's one of my favorite uh, Cuban poets. Uh, he really challenged the frameworks around uh, emotions with respect to color. And he's like, I'm so tired. He was uh, in the parlance of the day, Mulatto. Um, and he, he said, why, why should I have a, a heart that is pure and white? Why can the heart not be pure and dark and black as carbon? And I love that. Negro con carbon. It was beautiful. Um, thank you for your answer. And in fact, actually, uh, I misspoke at the earlier when I was talking about that room I walked into with the retrospective. It was Beckman. It wasn't Bever. It was Beckman. Well, it was Beckman. Yeah, because his, his lines they got thicker and darker with time. He started kind of muddying thin lines, and then it became these gorgeous jewel tones. And, yeah. yeah, that's funny. That's funny. Right. Yeah. Thank you for the corrected. Um, Carlos, uh, you have honed your ability to understand the lies that people tell themselves so they don't have to change their behavior. And when did you first discover this capacity, this perception, and how have you brought it into your fields of work, um, particularly with uh, yeah, and coffee shopping, murder love? Okay. Um, well, I guess everybody lies. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm not really, uh, afraid to say this, but I was raised by women, so I had three sisters and, and my mom, and uh, she was divorced, and uh, <laughs> I love my mom, but she likes all the time, exaggerating and gossiping about others and pretending things, I mean, not awful lies, just a little bit of an exaggeration of the truth, and you see that in, in, in media too, and then you realize that we're all lying all the time, pretending to be who we are not, or uh, just trying to save face. And uh, I guess I, I just realized last week, uh, I haven't mentioned this before, but I was, uh, I don't know how the Familia Boron came uh, on YouTube or something, mm -hmm. and it's a comic book that. Uh, do you know them? Okay, it's a comic book that lasted for about 60 years in, in, in Mexico. It's very well known in Mexico, it's very famous. And uh, and the main character is this woman who she's strong, she's smart, she's uh, she's always trying to, to get a book, and she's always lying, and she's always making all these schemes and all that, and she's very funny. And he's a real character, she's somebody that you can uh, that you, you, you can see in other people. So when exactly I realized, I don't know, when I was a kid, well, uh, that's something that you just notice that people lie all the time. <laughs> I mean, that's a fiction writing, right? Telling lies to get closer to the truth. But where's the money part? <laughs> yeah. You keep telling me. <laughs> I guess I'm also very influenced by, well, by the culture in Mexico and Balzac is one of my favorite writers, and, and both in the culture in Mexico, here in America, uh, like white America, white pop culture, like Superman or all that, uh, uh, everybody's a winner and everybody's a hero, or well, the main characters, and they're always winning and, and, and overcoming uh, challenges and stuff. Uh, La Familia Gouron was the total opposite. There were a bunch of losers living in a very poor neighborhood, and uh, she was always failing, and her husband was an honest guy who always repressed her and told her, you cannot lie, you cannot do, you can keep fooling people, you cannot keep doing experiments, and it was very crazy, and uh, so they're always losing, and uh, but they're always desperate because they don't have enough money to pay the rent or to buy some food. And also in Balzac, who wrote The Comic Human, and I read most of it, um, his characters are always struggling to get money to uh, 
So it's a real uh, struggle. And I guess if you live, if you come from a country like, like Mexico or, a, or a, not, not a rich country, you know what it is like to, to be poor and, uh, and uh, live in that world where everybody's broke all the time. So, so yeah, money becomes an important thing. And uh, we think it out of, uh, I mean, in, in American culture, it's not as important. And, and you don't see, uh, it's not, it's not an important plot, a part of the plot, money. In, in other cultures that are not rich cultures, it, it is. So I guess that, that's where it comes from. Everybody wants to make a plot. Well, I always tell my students, my writing students, that they need to know how much their characters make to the dollar. Mm -hmm. They need to know when they get that money, how they get that money, because it's going to influence everything else that they do in their lives. All the brands, where yeah. they shop, do they have child care? You know, what kind, what do they eat? Everything. And it's remarkable to me how many times people don't know that information, right? Um, so craft, craft tip. Uh, speaking of which, um, Juan Felipe, I've noticed that you have, we share love, which is for the M dash. Um, and I wanted to ask you, um, when you began, you know, how, how do you think of this, this form of punctuation in your work and why do you turn to it um, so frequently as I also do. You mean the like that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I began to like all that, you know. Uh, I began to like uh, using dashes and, and, and periods in different places and commas in different places. It became like a, I had like little magic ants that I could put, I could sprinkle into poems. Because you have the poem, you have the language, and it's going, you know, really cool, and you know, little, little Chevys, and, you know, type it around the page. <laughs> but if you, if you throw in some dashes in there, and you, uh, you put a, a period over here and a dash over here, and you don't put them you know, grammatically, you know, you, <laughs> you know, as Trump would say, grammatically. <laughs> That's okay. It's okay. It's okay. You know, Trump, it's okay. It's okay. So, so, so you, use, you use them as art in a way, right? Your language is art, and and, uh, and the periods and the commas and the de and the periods, commas, dashes, parentheses. They're a lot of fun. Parentheses are a lot of fun because you can fill them. You can put the whole poem in the parentheses and then continue your poem uh, around the parentheses. So you get like two for one. It's like two tortillas <laughs> in one tortilla. So <laughs> really, you know. You can have two poems in one, and you use the, the parentheses, and it'll, it'll get you, it looks so different, and feel so different. And the, uh, and, uh, you know, Gertrude Stein has, uh, has, a, has used the same thing, periods and all that stuff. And uh, she, there's a, I don't know where it's on, but there's a poem of hers that only, uh, you lift the page, and the words are over here, they're gone, but the, the end dash and the periods and the commas are still kind of being went through, and you see them on another sheet of paper. It's almost like the uh, electronic uh, diagram of the poem, or the nervous diagram of the poem. So it's it's, a, it's just a, it's, it's just so cool to look at to work with the, almost like a surgeon or a scientist. You can work with atomic particles of the poem by using dashes and periods, and instead of putting the period at the end. Where it's it's forced to be. <laughs> it lives in exile at the end of, at the, at the, end of the sentence. That poor little earth shape, little orb, has been has been put into exile at the end of all the breath. So it doesn't have any breath. It's already out of breath, right? So so you bring it to the middle, and, and it catches a lot of breath in the middle. It has a little life. It's unique in there. It has a, a personality. It has this little arm standing up. Thank you, Robert. The same is true with the dash. Even the dash is even cooler because it, you know, it's elegant. It's like a little, it's like a little Mercedes, you know. <laughs> That's a building. Anyway, I like I like all that stuff, and, and it's it's like uh, at least fifty percent of the poem is is all these pauses and the little symbols you put in, the little hieroglyphic thing. We're getting back at society. This is our Aztec language in disguise. So, so 
I just enjoy using it almost like art and moving it around uh, the poem. And it's a slick looking uh, symbol and it makes you breathe and stop for a little while. I like those, like it's like Chevy's, like Chevy parked on, you know, throughout the. I was in a lowrider festival the other day, and um, God, these cars are beautiful. They're amazing. Um, but for anyone who, you know, also shares love of punctuation, um, Anne Carson does these translations of Sappho, where she holds the space from the fragments that were found, and the fragments were found often because they. Um, they were wrapped in uh, papyri that were wrapped around bodies, and then they used particle accelerators to actually read what was beneath. And the people would reuse papyri, like they would use it for math and all the other things. And then they used these particle accelerators to find this word of this woman that all these, you know, the emperors tried to burn all of her work, and it just survives, you know. And so Anne Carson holds this space with these bracketing. It's really beautiful, except no other Sappho translation. Um, believe me, I've looked at them all, and now uh, Carson. Um, so, I love punctuation. <laughs> um, so, Carlos, you know, your characters basically live in this, they just avoid knowledge. They, they work, they know that they hate themselves in some ways, right? They're constantly fighting their self, self hatred. But the way that they kind of, you know, they up, they upload things on Reddit, right? They, they post on social media, you know. Um, and my, my favorite, you know, repeated phrase of Jimnesh is, um, I don't have the animus. I thought, ooh, animus. Uh, could you talk about that idea, animus, and how it plays out in the lives of American office workers? Uh, well, it means that he just doesn't, he's being lazy and he doesn't want to do something. But that Jimnesh is very pretentious, he wants to be a, a writer, and uh, that's the one thing that he can, uh, uh, hold to that makes him feel better than other people because uh, he uh, is very unattractive, he is bitter, he's always angry, and that. Uh, but if he feels that he's smarter and has a better language than other people, then, then he feels a little bit better about himself. So that's that's where the animus comes from. And uh, yeah, he spends a lot of time. Uh, on uh, instead of working, uh, losing time, uh, uh, wasting time on, on social media, uh, downloading uh, popular <laughs> posts, and, uh, and for Charlie, he spends a lot of time on Twitter and, and Facebook trying to get likes, trying to get uh, some love from strangers. Thanks. Wow. Asking for a friend and writing about that made you change your own behaviors <laughs> because. Um, I have to say, uh, part of being an author is being online um, these days, and so finding that balance with it is uh, is tough. Yeah, it is. It is. It is tough. Yeah. I, I don't like social media, but you I know too much about it. <laughs> but I know much. some, and, uh, and yeah, and uh, especially, uh, I mean, especially the writers are always trying to be too positive, and they're not being authentic sometimes because. And then sometimes you read something that, well, I don't care if you have uh, eggs for breakfast. I mean, <laughs> well, it's interesting because, you know, putting oneself, one vulnerabilities into this place, it's masquerading as a commons, but it's not a commons. It's a corporate platform designed to, you know, keep our attention available for advertisers. So it's, kind of a, it's a strange place to be vulnerable. I prefer to be vulnerable in my work and then yes. not do that in the, in the social media. media. Yeah. But, um, I would like to make space for uh, questions from the audience. Uh, while you're considering what you might want to ask, I have a final question for um, <laughs> In your poem, Koan says, you wrote, every human being in the village is an ever-opening story. Yes, you must write about each one. It is the bravest gesture. And I wonder if you could talk about writing into, or through, or about, or around, or against those of our countrymen who are filled with hate, and fear and rancor against brown peoples. They are not the center of everything we get more illegal, right? In fact, they're not even part of this like titular emotional we. But how do you reckon with those racist humanity? Have you found a way to collapse the different difference between like they and we? Uh, yeah, that's a big that's a big issue right now. We're all uh, dealing with uh, it's, it's uh, almost uh, colossal. Uh, we're all divided. 
and we, we continue to uh, nourish that uh, division, uh, thinking we're doing the right thing. Uh, but I accept, uh, sometimes it's, it's, it's a challenge, but I accept everybody, and because uh, we all suffer. We all suffer, regardless of our position, uh, regardless of our violence or our peacefulness. We still suffer. We're still brothers and sisters. So that's uh, that's my task. It's sometimes it's uh, it, it, as we all know. It, it seems that it's a insurmountable challenge, but it isn't. It isn't. Uh, so that's 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 what I've been uh, reflecting on. I've been uh, spending quite a bit of time on uh, exploring that and how to uh, what we need to do. And I think what we need to do is to nourish the roots of kindness, not the ashes of uh, of uh, opposition. So, so that's 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 what I've been uh, walking and uh, uh, building a collective of love. That's that's what I've been uh, uh, losing myself in that particular forest: uh, unity, harmony, kindness, compassion and uh, make it happen in one way or another. And I'm first in that line since I'm the one who's talking about it. And that is what I think about it is, uh, I just can't talk about it and not do it. So, so that's, that's what I do as best as I can. Uh, so uh, for example, when I wrote the, uh, this book called Cynical Taxi, it has to do with uh, Darfur. And I did the best I could to, uh, to, uh, to relate, I said, I, I don't know anything about Darfur, uh, and I wasn't born in Darfur. I'm not black and I'm not African, uh, but it's, it's, it's for me, it's not an issue. The issue for me is uh, to touch base with the suffering of the people as best and deep as I can. And right from that, uh, right from that, uh, from that uh, consciousness, not a character or a, or a, a uh, costume, but from my own consciousness. And uh, I said, so I included the children, I included the mother, and, and, and uh, but I said, I have to include the John Jovi, I have to include the killer in this, in this work. I just can't talk about the children and how they're suffering and, and write, and the mother and how she suffers and write. I have to bring in the killer into the story. And I have to touch base with that killer as deep as I can so I can write that killer into the piece. So, so that's, that's part of the process as, as, as a writer for me. Uh, of course, I could, it, it wasn't wearing you know, all the cool uh, you know, peaceful sign, peace sign or anything. Uh, but uh, I connected. That's how, that's how I go about it. You know, being kind to someone that has a, a viewpoint that you find just like not just as equal but offensive, degrading, it takes so much work into in, inside the self to give that person kindness. So I'm uh, grateful for your reminder that that is what is needed. Put it on a T-shirt. You know, water the roots of kindness, not the ashes of opposition. <laughs> Build a collective of, like a front back, right? <laughs> you know, how many people are giving messages? Um, does anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask? Because I, you know, want to hold space for your curiosities, and we are talking about a collective of love, so that means y'all. <laughs> Hand up, and I'll repeat your question if you, uh, if you have one. I have a question. All right. That character you're talking about, the one that's on the Facebook, looking for likes, kind of a bad character. Is he fat too? The well, is that the guy? Is that the same fat guy? There are, there are two guys. You mentioned the fat one, and the other one is Charlie, who is. Uh, uh, they both are the extremes of, uh, of a life of abuse, if you'd say that. Uh, both are gay. One is Indian American, he's fat and unattractive and bitter. The other one is from uh, Lakeshore, Kentucky, a little, very white town. He's very small. He's kind of pretty, but uh, he has a lonely voice. And uh, he's very, very, very gay. 
and uh, and because he's small and weak and effeminate, people have he's a pushover. People have taken advantage of him all the time. So he is used to to try to please others, but he's always trying to uh, take some advantage at the same time. And uh, so he's he's always on Facebook trying to get approval from other people because he's always craving uh, for that. And uh, there's a chapter in which uh, they go to the opera and he's very excited about going to the opera and he spends a lot of money on clothes and, and all that. And he's very interested in posting me about the event and, and stuff. And uh, he doesn't, he's, he's not really that interested in the opera. He's excited about being seen going to the opera. <laughs> And criticizing others, and, uh, and I guess we sometimes do that. I mean, uh, we're, we don't go to that strip, perhaps, but uh, we post pictures of ourselves going to interesting places, or our food, or things like that, so we can portray a, a, a better version of ourselves on social media, so people feel that we are better than we actually are. So that, you know, the last two last two weeks. I follow one of the Chicago's biggest artists, uh, uh -huh. and he went to Rome and uh, Italy uh, because there was a big show there. And he wrote so much on Facebook. He took pictures. He he, he posted a picture of him drunk trying to get up. Um, and that's John Gallagher. And I follow John. And yeah. I follow a lot of Facebook people. Who expose themselves, literally expose themselves, start crying all over the place. Yeah. And all the ones that I can make my friend, because they're not worried about what people or what they represent. They're not measuring themselves. They're just doing it. And sometimes it's subconscious that goes through. I'm on Facebook a lot, I'm on both ways. So I I think that those people could be very fucking entertaining. And, yeah. and also to, to let you know that they're not in balance. They're, not, they're not to be in compared to maybe the likes of you, maybe. They are people. And you have to love them and read them. Oh, well, you know, poets yeah. who don't write on Facebook their poems, right? I wonder about them. Who are they writing for? They're writing for a deal or something? Post your poems on Facebook. Post them. Post your narrative, that long narrative we just read. Post it on Facebook so people can well, see. There's many different ways to kind of access the comments, right? And I might challenge the notion that just because someone shows themselves in a compromised position that they don't care what people think. People occasion minstrelsy in their own ways often uh, because they are managing a complex emotional response to who they are as people. And so certainly social media is a, a, a really wonderful place to kind of examine human psychology. And I recommend that you read this novel to see where it looks like from the inside. Um, and I thank you for your comment. Okay. Would so, anyone else like yeah, to ask so, something? I, I just want to add something. So my characters are not using social media in a healthy way. But you can use it in a healthy way. Like most people use it in a healthy way, most common people. But for some people, it becomes a problem. And for Charlie, my character, it is a problem. The way he uses it. Uh, thank you. You know, one of the things that I have been missing during the pandemic um, has been in person events as a kind of commons. I was grateful for the space that was held online for my work and can be held. Uh, but now to be able to see your faces, see your nodding, hear your snaps, um, it's been lovely. Thank you so much for coming and thank you to Red and Press for having us. Just want to give one quick shout out to our amazing ASL interpreters. Yes. Thank you so much for having Sarah, Sarah Rasher, and Lillian Thompson. So thank you so much for the hard work that you did today. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I love your I love your